Good afternoon. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be with this uh, conference. Thank you to Beatrix and Magnus for inviting us to uh, inviting me myself uh, to this to this edition. Um, I don't know about you, but I've been enjoying every single moment of it. And uh, I was saying I'll, I'll be very sad when the, when I have to leave. Um, I'm I'm also very honored to share this uh, second half of our session with. Uh, Pai Drexel, we've been associated since the late uh, 90s um, in the context of our work with the Ruach Foundation and, and, and Network. Uh, and I want to say, you see on this slide the, the national colors of Sweden, um, which is my, my salute to your beautiful country and, and uh, you as, uh, as its people. Uh, for brevity, I'll use urban agriculture as opposed to intra-urban and peri-urban agriculture. It's not working. Okay. Um, on this slide, a, sel a selection of publications that benchmark um, IDRC's uh, reflection on the field. For over 30 years now, IDRC has been supporting this field of inquiry through academic research and pilot projects, fieldwork and awards, regional courses, manuals and policy briefs, municipal policy innovations and panels at global, global summits. Actually, one of our Agropolis awardees was uh, Marie Njenga, um, but she was associated to, with SLU during her doctoral research at the uh, University of uh, Nairobi. I'd like to say a, a word about RUAF. Uh, this is a think tank launched as a network in 1999 by ETC International in the Netherlands. It was funded originally by DEHIS, the, uh, the Dutch agency, and my program at IDRC until 2010. And RUAF's uh, global partnership today brings together select municipal governments, um, development NGOs, and research institutions. And, and essentially it's engaged in research, uh, technical assistance, capacity building and policy advice for UN agencies, national ministries and local authorities, as well as producer organizations and value chain uh, businesses. Uh, Dr. Joanna Lindahl from SLU uh, contributed to a State of the Art 2015 edition. On um, So this is the menu I proposed. I know you had coffee break. This is, a, this is more food. Um, a tableau d'hôte for you. Um, the essentially my concern is that the codified segregation of agriculture from the city historically is quite recent, and its force enforcement has been confined, uh, with signs of it being repaired in the global north. But in many countries, institutions are struggling uh, with a phenomenon that has been resurging over the last. 40 years. So I've, I have a question, which I, then I'll, I'll break down into three. Um, what can urban history teach us about how cities across societies and centuries have navigated the relationship between urbanity and agriculture? And how these lessons can help cities today to optimize to improve the logics happening on the ground for this agriculture to integrate into the city? And what are the challenges for this to happen that research can address? So the first part is about the appetizers, and I'll be very going breezing through those appetizers because we want to go to the, uh, to the main course. Uh, but essentially, for many years now, I've been exploring the, the literature, historical, archaeological, and ethnographic on cities, some 35, 36 so far, which over 4,500 years uh, prospered in the Indus Valley, Mesopotamia, Greece and Egypt, Rome and the Mediterranean colonies, Mexico and Central America, the southern U.S., the Andes, the Amazon, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Central Europe. A longer-term view on these cities' governance of their agriculture can lend uh, more robust guidance to us. The second part, the main course, 
Um, the question is, can we extract from urban agriculture on the way in the global south cities today some basic itineraries or logics by which people try to integrate agriculture into the ecology and economy of their city? And for this, I went back to uh, specialized literature as well as personal observations and IDRC projects that we support in over 40 countries. And for the dessert, what are some of the liabilities, the challenges that research can address in the future. So I'll go quickly through these slides without spending too much time on, on case studies. Uh, the first uh, finding is that we have clear evidence that even ancient cities that were crucibles of power, wealth, and cult made room for various forms of agriculture. They were anything but shanty towns where and when they flourished. Agriculture in these cities did not rhyme with arrested development. Those cities were highly protective of their urbanity and uh, had a great control on what would happen in and around their grounds. The second finding, cities' aristocracies played a central role in this, making room for select plants and livestock in and around the city for a wide range of uses. As in Rome with the Domus, Orti of the wealthy in Uganda, for instance, under the Buganda kingdom, UA equated to royal power and social, just, uh, social status. Likewise, centuries later in France, you have several examples like the Tuileries Gardens in Paris, which had kitchen gardens, vineyards, mulberry trees for silkworm, a menagerie for animals, etc. But this agriculture was not only the business of the privileged ones. Authorities funded, built, and administered important agri-food systems. Think of the Mexican metropolis and Maya city-states. Pope Adrian I's six domus culti around late, 18th, uh, late 8th century Rome. Our ancient cities also were very expensive artifacts. Authorities sought to increase the returns on massive investments in infrastructure and facilities within and outside their, their walls. Agriculture was a subsidiary activity, though not insignificant. On the island of Crete, Eleuterna had a hill crested with a temple whose roof collected rainwater, channeled and piped down into cisterns, which fed indoor basins and fountains. Then the water was evacuated to irrigate by gravity crop fields along the hillside. Production systems took also a wide variety of designs, making creative use of space, terrain, and site orientation, exposure to natural elements, and proximity to equipment and markets. The more challenging the conditions, the more ingenious were the designs. The higher value the produce grown or the livestock raised by residents. The truth is, more than their rural interland, cities had best concentrated assets need to conceive, test, improve, disseminate, even import agricultural innovations to better use their resources. Breakthroughs include a number of things, uh, convertible husbandry, game farming, new fruit cultivars, harvesting machines, heated fish tanks, double glazed water heated greenhouses, etc., etc. Even today, cities are cradles of innovation in this regard. To close this entry, this, this entry, true, our ancient city's stock of science and technology back then was more limited. But the agriculture which their, these cities incorporated was no less progressive, with motives and for benefits not foreign to those of contemp contemporary relatives in the global south. These few principles can be read as a durable legacy, which current urban policies should not only acknowledge, but inspire themselves from and promote. Moving on to the main course, today the issue is without constant attention to its urban character, agriculture sited in and around the city cannot cohabitate with the rest of the city, let alone flourish uh, with it, within it. To permanently, permanently set aside vast tracts of urban land only for agricultural production is probably a non-starter. It may, in fact, counter the dynamic relationship which agriculture can, uh, must entertain with the city itself. 
Many challenges faced by this resurging urban agriculture in the Global South come from institutions that do not facilitate UA's interaction with the rest of the city, especially where informal UA is more extensive. On the other hand, quite often, urban producers themselves either do not know or cannot afford available practices that could have them interact in a better way with the city. Despite these constraints, the agriculture tries to, this agriculture tries to interact in a good way with the city through at least four logics. The first one is about increasing the rent from space. The second one, the income of the enterprise. The third one, multiple functions. And the fourth one, improve the physical connectivity, the flow of resources between UA and other users. So here, of course, if you have low-cost access to an area which is vacant, so therefore has a low opportunity cost, agriculture probably is a very good alternative because it's a low investment compared to other productive land use. It's a very low investment uh, option. But what happens is that across the city, the cost of your access to land tends to increase from the periphery to the center. And over time, it increases where you are while the city grows around you. Opportunity cost also of growing plants and keeping animals may also rise if you can use the land area more, if, if you want to use the land area more profitably. So as the cost of access rises and the area to which you have access probably shrinks, as a producer, you tend to replace the lower value with the higher value crops. And this is what we see even through centuries. Um, a historical, a historical uh, specialist of food on, on, on Paris, uh, Florent Kellier, has looked at how this pattern has evolved over three centuries for, for Paris. So, as a producer, you tend to replace the lower value with the higher value crops and design sites in or on ground areas with others that are mounted above or off the ground, uh, which then can free the ground below for other uses. But your ability to do so will depend on tenure conditions, uh, your know-how, your resources, market access, if you're in the business of selling what you produce. While the same, and we've seen that in several cities, while the same producer may combine different stages at different sites to maximize returns, lower income people that lose access to stage one and two, which are basically on the ground systems, uh, have only stage three and four to, to, to turn to. And this is where they they're find themselves between a rock and a hard place. Um, because these, these are, are, are systems that are use uh, smaller spaces and the overall returns may be actually lower than what they would get from a ground level uh, kind of system. So we need more research on stage three and four for the lower income group. The second logic aims at short value chains where the geographic and relational proximity help build trust between actors along the chain. Producers seek to add as much value as feasible within their means to their raw produce to increase overall returns on their agricultural enterprise. This logic requires sufficient area for the close integration of the various stages from one to four. Um, very often, these are organized producers from different sites that may pool their produce at some common facility to process and, and, and sell it, or offer services that do use the products as ingredients, or they may be able to develop the full chain, excuse me, at a single location. For instance, a case of a community park in Central Fortaleza in Brazil, I can come back to this example. The second option is preferable when the net efficiency gains, of course, are greater. The third logic is about civic goods, and we haven't had much of a conversation on this logic at this conference. Um, it's particularly useful when producers use public, communal, or institutional land or area. 
it has received less attention, as I was saying, this conference. But here, the producers, what they do, they seek to perform various functions of, or services which their activity can offer to other urban actors. This in order to respond to these actors' needs and garner their support, either financial, technical, material, or even political. Partnering with other urban actors is crit critical, critical sorry, to making producers' activity viable. Next slide provides some examples of this. Um, market vegetable cropping next to the Independence Monumental Square in, in downtown Accra. Uh, the gardeners upkeep the, the, the area and in return are allowed to, to grow uh, some market vegetables. Two other examples. On the left, the Public Institute for Occupational Rehabilitation of Men with Disabilities in downtown Santo Domingo. Um, the interns are trained to grow rooftop vegetables and fruits, which supply the institute's cafeteria, but they also grow and sell ornamental plants to the local supermarket and also teach the techniques to local residents. On the right, in the Gandhiov district of, of Dakar, La Société Nationale des Eaux du Sénégal allows market growers to cultivate and draw water from its concession in return for their surveillance of facilities and equipment against vandalism and squatting. The fourth logic, this is the one less developed, but there were several allusions to it during the, this conference. It follows from the previous logic that UA sites can better perform various functions if they can easily interact with surrounding land use. This slide models four stages in resource flow between six plots on a city block. The resources can be applied to UA within the plot, either in its built-up or not built-up portions, the red, side, the red circles while surpluses can be shared and traded with adjacent plot, the red lines. The exchange may involve the capture, stocking, and distribution of lots of things, hot or cool wear, uh, air, rainwater, sunlight, and shade, organic, solids, and liquids, implements, etc. This logic can apply uh, at different scales and support the advancement of other logics. Stage one and four are less common because the stage one is basically an enclave, it doesn't have sustainability, and the fourth one really requires urbanistic frameworks which are still uncommon. Mind you, both the public and the private sector have been testing the ground uh, in this area and making progress. Virtual connectivity does help overcome weak spatial connectivity on the ground in the global north, but its impact on new way in global south cities is still very under research. An example of on-plot spatial connectivity over a decade with IDRC support that the organization Inwar Dam in Amman, jointly with the Jordanian government, tested new technologies to increase safe and acceptable use of domestic gray waters and reduce potable water consumption to grow food in low-income households. This is another example from the public-private uh, partnership, connectivity between adjacent plots in, in, in Durban. This rooftop gar garden is a joint initiative of the Municipal Architecture Department and a facility management company that uses the building. It recycles rainwater collected from an adjacent building and, sells some, and gives away some of its harvest food to a local charity. This is a city block uh, scale connectivity in Sao Paulo. The shopping center composed the daily average of 400 kilograms of food waste from cafeterias for application to crops. The plans are ex to expand the growing area from 3,000 to 9,500 me square meters available on the rooftop, and it will use more of the uh, liters of water currently coming out of the air conditioning system and supply fresh produce to restaurants in the center selling organic dishes. Now, some of the challenges uh, that need to be addressed. And there were several references throughout the conference on organizations and the value of organizing producers. And this is particularly critical in the urban environment. Progress on this challenge is critical for all the four logics we've just discussed. Informal market producers are often more organized than assumed by officials, but the problem is gathering and leveraging political capital has not been easy for them. Uh, for instance, an IDRC-funded project by the universities of Dar es Salaam, Malawi, and Greenwich in the UK created learning groups among peri-urban market vegetable growers. 
And this effectively, that was measured, helped them adapt to climate var variability, use fewer resources to produce more, raise their income and improve their livelihood. But longer term sustenance of this approach to innovation remains a, talent, a challenge due to a weak uptake by the higher levels of the extension services. What is the political economy of with in which these organizations operate and how effective are they in dealing with, with it? Who are their supporters, their allies, their partners? Who are not and why? We need to know more about good win-win strategies which can help informal UA activity gain recognition and official support. This is a, a quite unique combination of, and, and Pai is, is familiar with this, site. Since the 1970s, a collective of market vegetable growers in Accra makes use of a, makes use of a quite unique convergence of factors. A non-constructible uh, site, level, fertile land, well-drained, access to pipe water with charge shared among the, the producers, intensive short-cycled crops with quick cash flow and high market price in low supply season, fields that need um, next to a major roadway for quick evacuation of the harvest, well-organized growers generally, and tolerant municipal attitude. But this is sometimes just very, is very unique in some places. The next challenge is about the links between UA and urban policy. And, and really here, from a city's viewpoint, the question is, how can you help us solve some of our problems? The city is not there to solve agriculture's problem. Agriculture is there to try to help and solve cities' problems. It's a very different perspective. This challenge links back to logic four, the spatial connectivity, where more innovation is needed for synergies between urban agriculture and other sectors of activity in the city. And we are seeing, and we will continue to see over at least the next generation, a rising demand for evidence-based policy making on urban agriculture at both the metropolitan and national levels. IDRC has pioneered support to research for policy making on UA, and on this slide you find various uses to which participating municipalities have put this research. Some of the innovations, and I'll we go very quickly, are reduced water charges for authorized community groups, fiscal incentives for private landowners to lend vacant grounds to producers who don't have space, allocation of areas in public parks and flood-prone areas, wastewater treatment and recycling into food gardens at mosques and schools, and local food procurement by public institutions, including local airlines in the case of Ecuador. Again, on this slide, key messages flowing from the center's portfolio of policy research that were shared with local governments and stakeholders in various contexts. Out of the UN task force on the 2008 food crisis, UN agencies commissioned various surveys and case studies on the state of urban agriculture in Africa and LAC. Latin America and the Caribbean. These publications draw on results of IDRC-funded projects with several texts co-authored by 13 former IDRC project leaders. The third is about the third challenge is about the urban meta metabolism. This is ingestion, digestion, evacuation, recycling. This challenge speaks to logic three on multiple functions, where UA seeks to address needs faced by other sectors. If UA depends largely on its proximity to waste generating sources to help the city to close its nutrient loop, what kind of UA system can help the city recycle waste at a much larger scale? And we had several ideas floating around over these last two days. The volume of wasted resources from cities' metabolism is a major sign of dysfunction. What UA could reuse far exceeds what it has been able to do so. We're, we're simply not finding the ways to. So how can we do better? Some strategy can work at the, at the home level, at the neighborhood level, but at higher scale, uh, it is more difficult. Yet we find that the informal trade of organic waste achieved by UA operators in some cities is already remarkable. Check uh, Mexico City. It's, it's really impressive. Dr. Losada's group at the uh, Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana de Iztapalapa. CGIR's Urban Harvest Project also worked on this. 
IDRC has supported, this is a slide that's a link into Pi's presentation after mine. IDRC has supported pilots of different decentralized systems before the treatment of wastewaters and their reuse in agriculture. Community orchards in a co-op housing project in Metro Fortaleza, Brazil, stairway settling ponds with multiple agricultural applications in Lima and in Dakar. So my colleague Pai will, will further develop this topic. But the topic here dear to SLU, of course, uh, is urban livestock. And I think you're, you're dead on. You have, you have a tiger by the tail here. Um, urban livestock keeping is growing very fast throughout the global south. Its geography obeys the dynamics of other urban land users. And very often, um, you have the, the small, the space confined, smaller size, higher valued and care demanding livestock found in the more central locations of the city. And these often later supply grown up animals to larger units on the outskirts for finishing and market. What has exploded, however, is makeshift livestock keeping, and this is causing a lot of problems or risks. So how do we viably incorporate agri-urban production systems, including animal husbandry, into the build-up environment? How much time do I have? Two minutes, okay. Let's get this. The fourth challenge is about inclusive UA in the urban food supply. So this challenge links back to logic one and two, increasing land rate and adding value to produce. How can UA secure and expand its market niches in the food system increasingly dominated by industrial agriculture and corporate food retailing? UA for long has been complementing other supply sources. Agro-industry seeks to capture these market niches held by smaller scale agriculture, forcing it to innovate as so as to remain competitive. One can think of Nairobi's large poultry distributors who procure their supply from smaller peli-urban farms, or hydroponic farms in Santiago de Chile who supply local McDonald's restaurants. In large global south cities, the urban agriculture system is becoming increasingly diverse. The question is, how can, for the more inclusive systems, how can more models like Agrupan in Ecuador bring very low-income urban growers to improve their livelihood and hold on to a competitive market advantage in the urban food system? Out of this IDRC-funded municipal pilot project, the Agrupan program was launched in Quito during hard economic times and built on local community activism. It targets lower and lower lowest income groups, having trained more than 16,000 people from 200 enterprises, 800 and more than 1,300 urban farms, including 300 doing livestock. The average total earnings are quite good, and a good, it's a good example of progress achieved on all four logics over 15 years. Very resilient, survived three mayoral terms thanks to broad uh, popular uh, support, but also international recognition. The training has moved producers to shorter cycle, higher valued crops, more efficient use of water, etc., etc. But there is more potential to grow the number of producers, further diversify crops and livestock, and transform produce and increase sales through working on customer education, reaching out to the middle class, public procurement, and improving logistics to supply supermarkets. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you.